Welcome to another episode of Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. On this show, we meet artists transforming lives with their work. A while back, many years ago at this point, I moved to a neighborhood in South Berkeley. Very early on, I noticed that there was a man who walked around and around the neighborhood just yelling. And it was this really specific yell. It was like, ah, I can't really even do it justice. But it was just that one syllable, full throated and loud. This man was struggling with mental illness, but it was unusual because unlike many people you see on the street with mental illness, he was always nicely dressed in clean clothes and good shoes. I found out that this man lived only a half a block away from me and that he was cared for by his brother, who was a blues musician. Pretty soon his yell became just another part of my day. Sometimes he'd go out walking at night and the sound of his yells carried for what seemed like miles. When he went out walking at night, I would feel a little worried about him. Sometime after that, I signed up for a storytelling workshop where we were supposed to make a personal story. Well, I didn't want to do a personal story. I wanted to make a story about this man in my neighborhood, the man who yelled. When the day of the workshop came around, I presented my story idea. The facilitator, without batting an eye, said, okay, what does this story mean for you? I started to answer in some way that kind of intellectualized why I thought this story about this man was interesting. And he said, no, there's some reason you're gravitating to this story. What does this story mean for you? I sat there a few minutes reflecting. When I started to speak again, I realized that my throat had gotten thick and that tears were in my eyes. And I said what this story meant to me. I realized something that day. I can't tell any story if I don't know my own story. My guest on this episode is April Harris. April is someone who has dug deep to find her story. She calls this process finding your voice. April is a teacher and workshop leader at the Theater Lab in Washington, D.C., working as part of their Life Stories Institute. Like so many of us, she spent her life doing for everyone else, taking on the roles that life brought to her. Captain April Harris in the U.S. Army, mom to her two sons, whoever she needed to be to take care of business, she was. Until one day, she realized that she didn't know who April was. What did April want? And what was April's story? This process of finding her voice and sharing her story put April on the path to healing from trauma and healing the relationship with her children. Her work now is to help others find their voice. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Listen and let us inspire you. If you've been listening to the podcast since the beginning, you may remember that the very first episode featured the Theater Lab in Washington, D.C. and their Life Stories Institute. Well, since that time, I've spent lots of time perusing their website to see the classes that they offer there. I remember seeing April's class and thinking, wow, finding your voice. That sounds like an amazing class. Then one day, April and I connected on LinkedIn, but I had no idea that she was the person who taught the class that had so intrigued me. We decided to have a Zoom networking meeting, and after she told me the kind of work that she did, I said, oh my gosh, you have to connect with the people from the theater lab. They do that kind of work too. And she said, I am from the theater lab. I teach the Finding Your Voice class. I knew that this was a fantastic opportunity to dig deeper into a program that helps so many people by offering the guidance to find their voice and to share their story. I'm so glad that April was willing to come on the show to share her story with us. Hi, April. Thank you so much for being on this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. Can you start by introducing yourself and telling us what you do? Absolutely. So my name is April Harris. I am a, a writer, a poet, a storyteller. I am a facilitator of uh, Finding Your Voice uh, with the Theater Lab in D.C. Well, that's how I first became intrigued with what you do. I saw this class, Finding Your Voice, on the Theater Lab's website. I did a 
podcast with them earlier in the season. And I'm just curious, what is this class about? How did you get involved in this? What is your story? So Pam, finding your voice was something that um, I collaborated with Buzz to, to, to really hone in on a, a safe space where people could find themselves. So finding your voice is really a metaphor. It could be a transition. It could be speaking up. It is just about movement. Mm. But the safe space is what, when we come together as a tribe and we offer that to each other. And it's been absolutely amazing. Um, mm. And it started because I needed a platform to speak. Uh, been through mm. a lot of trauma in my life, sexual assault in the military. I spoke up, but was never heard. And so as I got promoted in the military, I felt like I had an obligation to make things better. My expectation about this wasn't really realistic, but I knew I had to make change. But we, we didn't have a platform. Uh, where do we speak up? Where, where do we tell where, where action is going to be taken? And then as a leader, how do I protect those who work for me? Mm. Was, it was harsh. I felt like I had to protect every woman in the United States Army. So unrealistic, wow. but I felt as a leader, I had to do that. But then I, as I was searching for this way to do that, Pam, I was really not trying to heal myself or find things to make myself better, but find something for others. That was the journey. Well, that's really interesting. I'm so curious to know when did you realize that you needed to heal yourself and what was that turning point for you? That turning point was... Uh, so I have two amazing sons. They had just entered in college about this time. And I would come home every day just complaining about what the military was doing. And they so wanted that time to be able to tell me about what they were going through in school. And uh, finally, they were fed up, Pam. And my son said to me, and he was furious. He said, Mom, why are you fighting for a country that's not willing to keep you alive? And I said, damn, wow. Yeah, that was a pivotal moment where I started to really dig and find out what was going on with me as a woman. And I found a program, a military sexual trauma program with the VA in Long Beach, California. That's where I was exposed to the arts. I uh, met mm -hmm. a lady named Ann Randolph and she had a kind of a telling your life story workshop and I attended and that started from there. I was like, this is a platform where I can have a voice. There was no military people attending the class, but they listened. They didn't make any comments. They didn't try to fix it. They just listened. Hmm. And I said, this is it. Why, why do you think that that's healing just to be able to tell your story and have people listen? What was that experience like? Oh, uh, she gave us a prompt and, it's, and it was, I hate. And I couldn't deal with that I, I, because I'm trying to love. I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to get better. And she said, feel it, embody it. And then she made me move my arms and stump my feet. And I was like, I hate, I hated the military. I hated my children. I hated my life. And then I turned around and I said, that's everything that I love. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I hated it. It was just draining me. There was nothing left for me. And I didn't even know there was a me at that point. And I just started to search and really identify with the woman. So I was no longer mom. I was no longer uh, Captain Harris or ma'am. I was just April. And I probably hadn't seen her at that point, Pam, in about 20 plus years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The wow. nurturer was gone. The caretaker was there for everyone, but the nurturer was gone. That's an interesting distinction. Yeah. Because caretaking is often associated with less than healthy relationships. I would love I would love for you to expand on that idea of the distinction between caretaker and nurturer and how how that even applies to yourself. There was no time or room for self. And then I served in the military which was about selfless service. And I was getting these accolades for, you know, caring for people and and the promotions and I mean I was excelling in my career. But that wasn't for me, that was for others. I couldn't even acknowledge it. I couldn't feel it. If my family couldn't be there with me, I didn't even want to do it. It was never for me. It was a caretaker. It was, there was no feeling in it. It was very robotic. I saw them, but I couldn't feel them. Even mm. my children. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, I used to say I was a dead man walking. 
And when my son said to me, they're not helping to keep you alive, it was like, damn, I get it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I want to hear more about this journey for healing. You started with this program with Ann Randolph, did you say? Yep. So I was in a program at the Long Beach Hospital, right? It was a, a residential program for people that had, women had experienced military sexual trauma. And um, I had already engaged with my son. They were full of art, creative. And so we had started dialoguing about maybe doing some poetry or some spoken word. And I found a moth competition on Sunset Strip in, in L.A. And I wound up there. And, and I think I remember nothing, Pam, but the light. The light was hot as crap. And I was standing on the stage. And I think the light probably gave me life. There was something about the energy of it. And I told wow. my story about being raped in the military and how I'd serve and how I'd lost my children. And there was some claps, but it was more of some breaths taken. I heard at the end and I, I exited the stage and I sat down. I had no one there to support me. And I felt like, God, I felt stupid. Once again, I wasn't heard. Uh. What for? That's all I could think of is what for. Same thing I said in the military when I told I had been raped and no one listened. So after yeah. that, there were many other occurrences and I just didn't tell. What for? Well, you're just brought up something that really hasn't occurred to me in such a clear way that, yes, you can tell your story, but there has to be someone on the other end receiving it. Oh, Pam, that's it. That's the profound piece of it. Because at the end of the competition, which I didn't win, which made me feel even more betrayed by these American people that I've served, a man and a woman came up to me and they said, thank you. They didn't say anything else. I didn't know their name. They said, thank you. There was a moment between us and they walked away. And I said, I got it. This is what we do. I was heard. They acknowledged me. They didn't have right. to apologize. They didn't have to own it. They didn't fix it. They just heard me. <sighs> That's so interesting. That was the beginning. Okay. So where did you go from there? Because I still want to hear more about this journey from that moment where you started to realize that the key was to have your story heard. And now that you're facilitating a class for other people. So what else has happened to get? Was it very soon after that? Oh, it was nonstop, even while still serving, because I didn't retire until 2015. I was taking classes across the country. I was looking for this thing, this, this platform to make a difference. I said, maybe I can take this to the military. Maybe I can take it to leadership. Then I mm -hmm. said, well, if they stand in my shoes with the rules that they had been implemented, show me how I was supposed to survive. Show me how I was supposed to keep my soldiers safe. That was the whole thing. And then I found this theater and I said, well, we can use that. Uh, we can modify it, the aesthetic, the narrative. I can own it. Oh, Pam, I dropped so much shame every time I took the stage. And it's weird because I told the story in front of many people that I did not know, that didn't serve, that wouldn't have understood my story. And they heard me. Yeah. And I said, others need this platform. So it was really about now understanding I need this to get better to help other people. So what do we do with this? How can I take this where others need it that are like me? And so I came across many other things. Uh, David Diamond, Theater for Living in Canada. I did some training with him. We did the, the documentary, uh, We Are Not Done Yet. So I did mm -hmm. it with uh, Jeffrey Wright and, and nine other amazing veterans. And we told our story. Um, mm -hmm. I got the opportunity to bring my son on, which was very important to me because they had not had a voice and to date still do not have a voice. So we're working on that. But my son, he just he acknowledged the suffering of the women and the other mothers. And at that point, I acknowledged that we had forgotten that they need to heal, too. So that's when the nurturing piece really became a prevalent in my life that I have a responsibility to my children as a mm -hmm. mother. And so I felt him at that point. And it just continued. And, and I came across Buzz and Deb, who you know, uh, Theater for Living, and they, they were doing a Life Stories event for veterans. And I, mm. I attended a couple of their events. And the difference between anything I've ever felt, Pam, was Buzz and Deb didn't take responsibility for what had happened to us, but they knew that they had a responsibility to make things different. And they could uh -huh. use their platform. That's so interesting. 
So once you took the class with them, how did it come about that you started working with them? I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't stop. And they they saw what I was trying to accomplish. And I kept communicating with them. My stories kept getting better. I started bringing more people in so they could experience it as well. And the kind of nurturing that the theater lab provides for people is a family. It's an institution of sorts. I mean, they're magnificent at what they do, but it's way deeper than that. And they did a show uh, with some homeless women from D.C., And I saw how they treated them, how they respected the stories, how they honored the women. Uh, There was no Mm -hmm. pity. Uh, There was no pampering or coddling. It was just a platform and lots of love. And I said, Mm -hmm. this is a place where we can get this work done. And uh, I got a call last year and they said, we want you to be a facilitator. And I said, me? I'm not an actress. I perform to heal. And it was just amazing. And and they've given me free reign to bring uh, Finding Your Voice to many people. And we're doing it virtual now. And it's just been amazing. Right. Well, I'd love to hear more about the class. I think you know by now because you started a new session. But my daughter signed up for that class with no prompting from me. She often goes on the Theater Lab website and picks out the next class she wants to take. So she signed up for this class. And I know you guys just got started. What types of things do you do in the class and what types of people wind up in the class? So I'm praying that we can continue this class virtual Mm -hmm. because, again, much like your daughter, I'm the only one in the DMV area of the six Mm -hmm. participants in this particular class. We've had lawyers. We had one lady and she's actually was the um, ghostwriter for for Sissy Houston. So the range is just And these are successful, successful people that are trying to find their voice. A lot of them are doing work for other folks and not for them, much like I did Mm. while I served. It was all Mm. about other people and giving, but it was depleting and nothing for me. So we grow together. I start off with uh, I am. So that's the first prompt. We do something called SWAT, which is something that I use as a, a project manager in the corporate world where we're looking at our strengths, our weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then we finish it off with uh, I want. And as adults, very rarely is someone asked, what is it that you want? And then we start to look at the, and it's important that they write these prompts, even though they are read. And the reason why is because they need to look at the words that they use. Words are often been used against us, but we break down the words. What do they mean to you? What have they done to encourage you? Or, or not encourage you? And also who gave them to you? And why do we own them? Why can't we just take those, hear them, and leave them where they're at? That's fascinating. I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have any details of those types of words that yes. might be either things that encourage us or discourage us? Or, or you know, because this These are all the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves, but where did these come from? And I'm just so curious to know. That's it. And again, respectfully so, and that's something we say in the class, that we're going to keep a safe space. We don't attach names, but this is so much energy and work that we want to share this information with others. We want to respect those that have given it to us. But what I see at the beginning of the class first day, we're crying, we're laughing together. I mean, the first day there's tears. Because the space the tribe creates is a space of comfort where Mm -hmm. I can practice or say whatever it is I want. Uh, So we see a theme. This particular class has been talking about pretending, not acting, but pretending, not being able to be who I want to be or still trying to find that out and trying different roles on. And that's okay too. We just Mm -hmm. want movement. Uh, But things that we hear is we notice that some of the strengths are also turn out to be weaknesses. So uh, you, you'll hear that I'm a go-getter. I'm a caretaker. I love people, but I don't like people. I want to be an advocate for things, but I don't want I want to isolate. So when we begin to look at these, they're true contradictions. What is it that you really want? And a lot right. of times, even for myself, it wasn't so much uh, what I did was selfless, but it was also selfish because I really wanted all those things to be given to me. I gave mm-hmm. to people what I truly wanted for myself. That is so, that resonates really deeply with me. I don't know how old you are, but based on the age of your children, 
I would say that we're fairly close to your how? 53. 53. Okay. I'm 56. And I often think about generations. And there are a lot of things I think maybe that younger generations are perhaps doing better in terms of self care than our generation, the Gen Xers did and what we carry around. Do you find that with generations? I'm so curious, or is it this is across the board work that can be beneficial no matter I think what it's age? so beneficial, Pam. We've had at least 60. So we've had members in one class that range from anywhere from 19 to 60. So I was wow. a little concerned about the gap, mm. but the nurturing that the elders were able to give to the youngster with mad respect It was never do this or do that, or you should be doing that. It was never that. It was always with kindness and we always offer. It's always an offering. We always ask, would you like the offering? We don't just blurt out because we got to respect the space and why people are there. So I I see that. I thought it was going to be an issue, but it turned out that they gave as much as they received. And I'm just blessed because I get to attend every class and I just get enriched with every discussion. And there is a performance of sorts at the end. We've had dancing. We've had singing. I'm very scarce with instructions. And I see people will come and they want me to tell them exactly what to do. And I tell them that if I do that, I can project onto you. I can manipulate where you will give me what it is that I think you should give me. I don't think that's fair in a class called Finding Your Voice. Right. So the the journey of this class is that they come in, they start with this prompt, the SWOT, S-W-O-T, Strength, Weaknesses, Opportunity, and Threat. Absolutely. And then eventually they wind up with a performance of their choice in whatever way they want to express their voice in this class. Exactly. We've had things manifest from people not wanting to be in the country anymore and how that felt. We had someone talk about, and she was Caucasian. She lived in DC, Black Lives Matter. And she gave us a writing. When I tell you, it gave us all chills. It was a different perspective because she wanted to know why did they have the right to speak for her as a white lady? Why? She wasn't, I mean, what did this mean for her? And then the consequences of what they did now being placed upon her. Man, she gave us a piece and she's in the theater labs honor program. It was amazing. So it's just a lot of dialogue about where I was at the beginning and where I am now and where I'm going. We've had people do roadmaps for their journey. We've had a young lady that wanted to be a director and she had written a very small piece she shared with us that she had never shared with anyone to include her family. I'm going to tell you, that's an honor, Pam, when people open up day one with things they have never talked about with their family. We've had uh, two men, typically one or two men in the class with all women and the sharing and both were getting ready to be fathers. So we were able to nurture that and really push. And and again, I asked if I can push and I just give them back the words. I'm watching body language when they say something. Are they owning it? Are they skeptical about it? Are they filling it out? Just (laughs) really, it's amazing. Uh, The work Mm -hmm. is amazing. I want to go back a little bit to talking about your sons, because you're touching on another thing, which is sort of the healing of intergenerational trauma, which I think a lot of us would like to know better how to do that. So in talking about your relationship with your sons, you said that they were creative first. How do you feel that your journey in turn affected their healing journey. Whew. What I realized, I was all about trying to heal so I could be a better mother. What I didn't realize as a mother, I didn't realize that they needed to heal. So when I came to that epiphany and my son's one it likes to sing, so he does a lot of writing music. The other one is working on a book. And I gave them carte blanche, Pam, to write or talk about whatever the hell they wanted. I stood on stage and I acknowledged that I had verbally and physically abused my children. I owned my shit. I had to own it so they could begin to heal. There's excuses for my behavior, but I never gave them that. Because as a mother, there's never an excuse to speak to or do the things that I did. I loved them. I loved them hard, but they deserve better than the best. 
And so now my babies, 29 and 30, are giving me the opportunity to be the mother that they deserve. But I will tell you, when you talk about the generational crap that's carried over, that's not spoken of, that's unacknowledged, I got into epigenetics just trying to understand that. But there's a piece of this that is huge to where it brings me even more in that mother mode. We, we did a the documentary, so we did a, a performance in uh, Telluride, Colorado. After the performance, mm-hmm. and I had stood on stage and acknowledged my stuff, I walked out, it was dark, and this stuff is emotionally draining. I was done. And a young white guy walked up to me. He never said his name. He just started off with that his mother had passed away. She had been a drug addict. She was uh, found dead. She'd probably been uh, deceased probably three days. They don't know if it was an overdose or suicide. And he looked at me and he asked me, could he hug me? Mm. And we hugged for about two minutes. He released me. He walked away. Never seen him again. Don't know his name. But I said, again, there was that epiphany of I got it. As a mother, any mother can acknowledge and give that love because his mom is gone. So does that mean he doesn't get to do his work? By me standing on stage and acknowledging my shit, Pam, that baby was able to do his work. And out Mm. of that, I got a project coming up and it's called Project Restoration Letters to Heal Our Legacy. And I'm getting mothers across the country to write letters. And we're going to do it in a storytelling fashion, hopefully some podcasts coming up and some uh, live performances. And again, it could be to their children that may be never read to their children, but just putting it out there in the atmosphere with some responsibility, some ownership, so our babies can begin to heal. Because mothers give birth to life. We can give birth to healing, too. Oh, that's beautiful. Wow. Well, it's so interesting because I saw you on the Theater Labs page, but then we connected on LinkedIn, and I kept looking at your picture thinking, I know this woman, I know this woman, but how do I know this woman? And you reached out to talk to me. And it's so interesting to me that we made that connection in another space besides Theater Lab. What made you reach out to? I, I use LinkedIn to, to really make some connections. And I don't know what the search was, but I came across the, the name of your podcast and it was Art Heals All Wounds. And I mean, it just took me back because it can, it does. And the potential of it is not, we just scratched the surface And I said, I've got to find out more about this lady. And when I saw your picture, it was like I knew you, like like we were kindred spirits. And then I started doing a search. I listened to your podcast. I looked at your documentaries and I said, I got to reach out to her. And I did. And you responded. I was like, oh, shoot. She responded. And, and, And then when we talked and found out that we love the same people. And you said, hey, you're in the D.C. area. You need to check out the theater lab. I was like, hey, I work for the theater lab. And, I but I will tell you, Pam, that this journey, this art thing does that for people. It brings us together. You and I are nothing alike. We're moms. We're on a journey simultaneously. But mm-hmm. it was that that brought us together. And, right. and this connection, this dynamic connection, we can do this with people. I don't have to know you to be able to hold the space for you. That's a beautiful concept, holding space for someone. It's true. We can all do that. It doesn't cost me anything. I don't lose. It doesn't deplete me. I'm just holding the space. And I can choose to do that when I'm able to do it. That's selfless service for me. But you can also choose to take care of yourself when you need to do it, which is it sounds like is a huge revelation for you and I would say for a lot of people. I agree. The journey set out to do it for others because I had a responsibility as a leader. Mm. On the journey, I learned that I had a responsibility to April, the woman, and the Mm. woman needed to be cared for first. Now I can hug. I can hold people. I'm not afraid of the touch. The nurturer in me, I want to say it's been restored or reinvigorated or I don't know. I don't give a damn. It's there. I can give it to my children. Pam, I can give it to your child. I can give it to you. And it's just love, sis, holding the space for others to do the work that they need to do. Mm. I don't want to own it. I don't, you know what I'm saying? I just want to be on the journey. I say I'm a personal accountability partner. That's it. Not Mm. a coach. You tell me what you want to do and let's find a way to get it done. And finding your voice is one of those ways. That's so beautiful. I'm so glad we did connect. Yeah, that was a great connection. 
Thank you. And I, I knew immediately when I talked to you that I wanted you to be on the podcast and share your story because even just the brief conversation we had, it was so inspiring. So April, where can people find out more about you and the work that you do? Google the Theater Lab, uh, the Life Stories Institute. Give us a call. We're going to go global. So we're trying to do some work with our sisters in Africa. Uh, we're working with young ladies in D.C. Everybody has a story. And the younger we give, especially my young sisters, the ability to speak their story, their truth and own it, the better off it's going to be. That's wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. So theaterlab.org and then Life Stories Institute. Also, I know that if they search their classes, they'll find your class finding your voice. And if there's yes. something we can do for anyone, they just contact us. The theater lab is ready. They're committed to making a difference. Yeah. You guys are a very, very special organization. I'm yes. honored to be a part of it. Yeah. You guys, I have to say, I've, I I've have a very huge place in my heart for Theater Lab because you really do. You really have taken this idea of theater so much deeper than someone than I could have ever imagined. Yeah. It can make change. Yeah. Yeah. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Remember to be in touch on my Facebook page, Art Heals All Wounds, and also on Twitter and Instagram at Art Heals Podcast. I'm so grateful to April Harris for being on this episode and telling us about her class, Finding Your Voice. If you want to learn more about April and this class, you can go to theaterlab.org. That's T-H-E-A-T-R-E-L-A-B.org. And you can look up their classes and you'll find April's class, Finding Your Voice. You can also find her work under the Theater Lab's Life Stories Institute. This episode was edited by Eva Herstova. The music you've heard in this podcast is Yellow Light District and Otto Waschenlage Instrumental by Lobo Loco. Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 15 in D Major was performed by Karina Galanian. The beautiful saxophone music in the intro was by Stan Rams. A very big shout out to Robert Kershaw at the Story Center in Berkeley, who helped me to find my story. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and share with your friends.